Welcome back to the Ross Bolin Podcast, presented by Bolin Media. I am Ross Bolin, here today with producer Cade Orris, who is a little hungover from his date last night. Cade, say hello to the people. Hello, people. Cade is out living his young life, and I, on the other hand, think I am potentially on the verge of a midlife crisis, and I'm scared. I don't really understand when I'm supposed to have my midlife crisis, but it feels like I'm probably getting into the right age range. Like, I'm 35 years old. If you double 35, you get 70. That's quick math. And I drank heavily and did a lot of drugs for like 15 of my formative years. So I feel like living until 70 would be a pretty solid accomplishment, really. So I could for sure be at the midway point of life. I guess technically... I could be well beyond it. We could all die at any minute, kid. Does that any help your second, hangover? Uh, no, it doesn't make it feel any better. But. No, but it's true. You never know. Any day you could go. But I'm 35. I'm on my second marriage. Just had my first kid. I've got a four-year-old stepdaughter as well. I go to therapy once a week. I drive an electric vehicle. I have four dogs. I'm five years sober from alcohol. I haven't smoked weed since October. So I'm just a straight-edge freak show now. I don't have any tattoos that count. I make estimated tax payments. I work out twice a week in my garage. I wear wrist guards to sleep so my carpal tunnel doesn't flare up at night. And Elon Musk is taking away my blue check mark, which was really my biggest professional accomplishment that I valued more than my college diploma. I have absolutely zero edge left to me. I mean, my wife was painting my nails for a while to help me stop biting them and because I wanted something about me to be like Harry Styles. But since we had the baby, there just isn't any time for that. So I've lost the only remaining edge I had. Perhaps no one is more primed for a midlife crisis than me. Every day, I fight the urge to grow out my hair, put two 12-inch subwoofers in my Tesla, and start smoking Parliament lights by the dozen while I cruise around town bumping 3-6 Mafia. I used to be a piece of shit, and maybe going back will make me feel alive again. Maybe if I have my midlife crisis now, just get it over with, it'll be less noticeable to my kids since they're so young. They won't even remember my transition from boring straight-edge dad to total badass midlife crisis monster. Maybe now is the time to trade the Model 3 in for a Corvette with an absolutely obnoxious exhaust pipe set up and just start terrorizing my neighborhood. I've never better understood people that make drastic changes to their hairstyle or like get a full sleeve tattoo or rip heaters while they're pumping gas into their Chevy than I do right now. Sometimes you just have to do something to shake shit up so the weight of life doesn't crush you like a paper cup. Being a human is funny like that. And for me, because I lived in a constant state of chaos and worry from age 14 to 32 before really making progress in therapy, feeling like everything is fucked That's sort of my comfort zone. That's where I feel most at home. So now that I'm 12 years into my career, been fairly successful, have kids in a stable home, and have been self-employed for four years, I am almost never at ease. It doesn't make any sense. I should be more at ease now than ever. So maybe if I grow out my hair and shave my face into a goatee, and start ripping vanilla-flavored cigs and collecting sports memorabilia and driving a penis compensation car with dual exhaust and commit tax fraud and watch a John Wick movie every night before bed, things will feel right. I'm just thinking out loud here. I really hope my therapist isn't listening to this episode. I feel like, have you thought about getting a motorcycle? I feel like that's the the typical midlife crisis purchase. So I'm watching Perry Mason on okay. HBO. You yeah. familiar with Perry Mason? Yeah, I haven't watched it, but I, I know what it is. It's yeah. solid. It's like a detective L.A. noir set in like the 1930s? I'm guessing. I'm guessing on the decade. I don't remember. Um, but uh, he has a motorcycle, and mm. he like recklessly drives it at night just aimlessly at high speeds, and in like episode one or two of this season, he uh, he like falls off of it. And I, I watched that scene, and I was like, maybe this is what I need. <laughs> oh, you saw someone falling off the motorcycle. I was like, no, what? That's that's why I need. Well, he my was life. totally fine, and he didn't even have a helmet on. See, I feel like that's not the case usually. You don't think that's accurate? No, that's probably not, not how it goes down usually. But yeah, no, I'm only 25, so I have not reached this point in my life, and it sounds like I got another decade at least before I I start feeling this type of way. Yeah, because I mean, you are getting up there. You yeah, know? Y- yeah, I. <laughs> 
<laughs> Guys like you and me, we're built pretty similarly, though, you and I, in terms of, like, uh, uh, you know, the mental health stuff we deal with in our in our general mindset, I feel like. I feel like guys like you and I are very prone to the midlife crisis. So just, you know, be just aware. Be, up, be on the lookout for And in for about it. a decade, it's going to start to get weird, and you might feel the sudden urge to do incredibly dangerous things you never had the urge to do before or that you once did in your younger more idiotic years which is also where i'm at that's like because i did so much dumb shit between the ages of 14 and then 30 really for like a good 16 year stretch there i was just a reckless lunatic that i have all this previous knowledge about how to live like a guy that's experiencing a midlife crisis so i feel like i could i could use that now but I'm trying really hard not to, because it doesn't feel safe. Like it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't feel responsible, you know. So, yeah, I just, I think I'm boring. That's what I'm saying. I you just think don't I'm, have a lot of excitement in nah, your life. No, I don't do. I don't. You're all, you're all settled down. I'm too. I'm very settled down. I'm very, very, very settled down, and it's it's uncomfortable because I'm not used to it, and that's one of the things I focus on with my therapist is. Uh, is like settling into my new life. Frankly, I made just an absurd amount of sweeping changes in a three-year period. Like from 2019 to 2023, my life completely fucking changed in every conceivable way. So like I'm still, I like wake up in the morning and I'm still getting used to it. Like where I am now versus where I was four years ago, which is, it's a weird thing, but that's the way it goes. And it's forcing me toward one of, I think the biggest like, the biggest indicator of when I was a piece of shit back in the day was my hair. Like I'm, oh, I, oh, yeah, because you had the lettuce back in the day, I didn't mean, you? I mean, really, really bad lettuce. Like, the worst lettuce you've ever seen in your whole life. Like, your hair's long, but there's, a, there's like, a, a shape to it. Yeah, it's there's got a, some flow. And it, in the, yeah, yeah. You've, you've got something going on there. I had probably 3x the amount of hair you have currently going not lengthwise but just like it was just a giant bowl of of terrible lettuce that should have been discarded and it like hung for like the bangs were the confusing part like you've got the the slick back going yeah. <laughs> you're a real piece of shit <laughs> but but i had i had it just hanging down over my eyes like in my prom photo which i, I will i think i've seen i will show some, it to you again pictures just to it. remind yeah. you it is it is inconceivable how I got up every day, looked in the mirror, and went, yeah, this is it. This is the this look is right fucking here. It. <laughs> this is what I need to be rolling around looking like, and people will respect this. Like, if I looked over, if I was in traffic on the way home today after work, if I look over and see something that looks like me in the car next to me, I'm getting away from that vehicle as quickly as possible because that kid is in a bad place. And didn't you, like, refuse to like, cut it off for baseball, right? Yeah. Like, you refused to cut off that lettuce? And this was, like, a recurring theme in my life. Like, I refused to cut my hair for baseball, and inevitably it, like, pushed me off of the team. Like, I had to quit baseball because it was so, uh, it was such an important part of my identity that I was like, no, hair over organized sports, which was probably the only healthy thing I had going in my life at that point, yeah. that I was on the baseball team. But, uh, yeah, it just... It, then when I was in college, when I was a pledge... In a fraternity, they told me I had to cut my hair, and rather than going to get a haircut, I cut it myself in the mirror, and it looked even worse. But this is me at prom. <laughs> 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 like, I mean, it's just, it's like, it's you, utterly... Like you can barely see your eyes there. Th you can see one eye, like a little bit of one eye, but it's like, why... Look at that. It's like it's like the hair grew, right? But then they cut some out so my face would be there. Right, yeah, there's like a little bit at the top where it's like you can kind of see your eyes. And I don't understand, like, when I was going to the barber shop or whatever, you know, sports clips or great cuts or whatever the fuck, like, what were they doing? What was, what the, well, why yeah, did your they, problem why is you're going to a, a great clips or, or sports cuts or whatever. I didn't whatever know they, any better. Yeah. But, like, somebody should have helped me. This is, it was terrible. I mean, we'll get a photo. If you're watching on YouTube.com slash at the Ross Boland podcast, we'll just put it up on screen for you. For the others listening, maybe I'll make it the episode cover image, because I don't think I've ever used this this before. I also feel bad for my date. Like, she went to prom with me looking like that. Like, what a what a mess. Although she did have uh, an uneven amount of self-tanner on her face, and it cuts off at the neck, 
and then she's much wider below than she is above, which is a funny ass look. But I mean, and also when you look at my parents, you can see where I got this like terrible idea. Like, look, neither of them has. I mean, my my mom looks fine, but my yeah. dad, you can tell. Your dad, yeah. Like that's, he's that's where you got the hair from. Yeah, that's that's where things went wrong on some level with me hair wise. But yeah, just just for whatever reason. When I find myself being like, is there some edge I can get back? I always revert to the hair first. Like, I want to grow it out because I've had it together for so long. But the problem is, for anybody who's ever grown out their hair, you know, the it's the middle phase that sucks. Yeah, that's like, like the right awkward now, I have, phase. Yeah, yeah, I have an organized haircut. And if I let it go long, there's going to be a couple months stretch here where I'm just going to look like an absolute fucking doofus. Which I guess is fine. I could just wear a hat every day. It's not like I'm in a professional office. Yeah, setting. I started growing my hair out during COVID, and so like I wasn't around people a whole lot. So smart I, like, move. I had that awkward phase during COVID, and then once I got past that, and like we were able to go outside again, people were like, "Oh, I like you with the the longer hair." I'm like, I never grew my hair out before. I always really? did like a buzz cut or like like short on the sides, and then during COVID, I just like fuck it. Welcome to grow. Austin, Cade. It's poisoned you in your <laughs> mind. Now you're just gonna look like all the other fucking hipster douchebags out there like me it's fine you'll be fine anyway wedding season is upon us and especially for those of you who are more casual dressers like i am i know that means a lot of pressure to find a suit that actually looks good on you i can't tell you how many times back in the day i had a wedding coming up and i just pulled an old dusty suit out of the closet and put it on like the day before the wedding only to realize the piece of shit didn't fit me anymore and I looked like absolute garbage. Fortunately, today's episode is also brought to you by Indochino. Looking sharp all wedding season shouldn't be expensive. Uh, with a custom fitted suit from Indochino, you'll create priceless memories without costing a fortune. Customize every detail on your suit, shirt, dinner jacket, and more in a range of colors from traditional black or gray to burgundy or olive to a classic Hemsworth navy. I can tell you personally, the Indochino experience is incredible whether you go to one of their showrooms in person to get measured up or you just do it from home using their website. I have done both now. I went to the Indochino in Austin the first time I used Indochino, but for my most recent order, I measured myself at home with my wife, checked out all their wares strictly online. The end result is still the best custom clothing experience I have ever had. I got the Stockport wool linen olive suit with a Halesworth basket weave shirt, a look you can find on my Instagram that many of you have complimented me on. It's my favorite suit and shirt combo I have ever owned, and I got all that just from ordering on Indochino from my computer at home. A lot of you have asked me. So again, the green suit you'll find on my Instagram is the Stockport wool linen olive suit. Every Indochino suit is made to your exact measurements. That's why it looks so good. And you can customize every detail, create a suit that fits you and your style perfectly with options for fabrics, lapel shape, custom monograms, statement linings, and more. They're always adding new pieces and options so you can stay on trend and in style, explore their relaxed yet refined approach to spring suits with their new spring fabrics. RSVP, knowing you've got the perfect look all wedding season long from Indochino. Go to Indochino.com and use code RBP to get 10% off any purchase of $3.99 or more. That's I-N-D-O-C-H-I-N-O, Indochino.com, promo code RBP. Grab your light, this is Stop the Wikipedia, when you're high. Stop the Wikipedia, when you're Today's Stuff to Wikipedia When You're High is Yoshi Shiratori. Yoshi Shiratori was a Japanese national famous for having escaped from prison four different times, making him an anti-hero in Japanese culture. There is a memorial to Shiratori at the Abashiri Prison Museum. You gotta be a bad motherfucker for a prison you escaped from to house a memorial in your honor. So let's get into his escapes. Again, there are four of them. First, he was falsely accused of robbery and murder, so Shiratori was imprisoned at Aomori Prison in 1936. However, after studying the guard's routine for months, he escaped by picking his cell lock with the metal wire that was wrapped around the bucket provided for bathing, and he escaped through a cracked skylight. Before escaping, 
He placed floorboards onto his futon to fool the passing guards into thinking he was still in there asleep. Classic Ferris Bueller move. Who among us hasn't piled pillows into our bed to convince our parents we were in there asleep while we were out smoking weed out of a Coke can behind the garage, right? Did you go all out with it, though? Like, you know, get the uh, the trophy and, like, the rope tied to it so when they opened the door... You could sit it up? Yeah, and, nah. like, had the... Didn't have, like, the, the speaker playing snoring sounds or anything like that? No, nobody, nobody can pull off the full Ferris. Yeah, no, that's pretty, pretty tough to beat. Yeah, he was really, really good. The best of all time. The, gro- the GOAT really, of fake sleeping in his bed and skipping school. Uh, it says, after his escape, police recaptured Shiratori three days later when he was stealing supplies from a hospital. He was sentenced to life in prison for escaping and theft, and he was transferred to Akita Prison in 1942. At Akita Prison, Shiratori was placed in a cell specifically designed for escape artists, featuring high ceilings, one small skylight, in smooth copper walls. They stuck dude in the Houdini cell. Nevertheless, Shiratori was able to scale the walls and noticed that the wood holding the window bars was beginning to rot. What is he, Spider-Man? How the fuck do you scale smooth copper walls? I guess Shiratori was just built different. It says every night he would climb up to loosen the vent until he finally managed to pry away the wood and open the skylight. Knowing prison staff would be able to hear his footsteps on the roof, Shiratori waited until a stormy night to climb the walls and escape. He pulled the old Shawshank Redemption move, the thunderstorm cover. You seen Shawshank yeah, Redemption? Yeah, I've seen it. Okay, good for Doesn't you. Doesn't he, um, like, use a spoon to, like, carve out, like, the, the wall or whatever? Is yeah, that... but at the end, he, he waits, like, when he's almost done, he waits for, oh, no, yeah, he gets through the wall and then there's, like, something else he has to bust through. So he waits with a hammer, and he, like, strikes it every time uh, yeah. that there's a thunder strike so that it, they can't hear it. But, uh, yeah, he also crawls through a what, river like a, of shit yeah. two miles long. <laughs> <laughs> That's not what Shiratori had to do. He just uh, used the thunderstorm. Anyway, three months later, he shows up. Uh, this is his second escape, remember? And they used a special cell for him. He gets out anyway, and three months later, he shows up at guard Kobayashi's house to ask for help in case, in a case against injustice in the Japanese prison system, as he was one of the only people who had shown kindness and respect to Shiratori during his stay at the Akita prison. He showed up to one of the prison guards' houses. This dude was reckless. It says, however, while Shiratori was in the bathroom, the guard called the police because, yeah... And Shiratori was arrested yet again and sent back to prison. This dude wanted to go back. Like That is the only he, explanation. He wanted to see if he could do it again. I think he was just testing himself repeatedly. He was like, I've done it twice. Fuck it. Once, one more. I'm going to go over to that guard's house, the nice guard, and let him call the cops on me. Throw him a bone. So, during the winter of 1943, Shiratori was transferred to Abashiri Prison in northern Hokkaido, the country's northernmost prison. So, it's the furthest north. And he was still wearing summer prison garments because I guess he just didn't keep up with the prison styles, right? And uh, he was thrown into an open cell exposed to the extreme cold, which sounds like a human rights violation. But uh, it says he was allowing, or it was allowing the guards to beat him whenever he stood up. So they really, really weren't trying to let this guy get out this time. Angrily, Shiratori vowed to escape and to the guards' amazement, broke his handcuffs in front of them. This guy sounds like a fucking superhero. Seriously, like he's like the Hulk combined with Spider-Man now. Later, he was placed in a specially made uh, set of handcuffs, taking nearly two hours to unlock by a specialist who came once per week so that he could bathe. So they got him in handcuffs that took almost two hours to take off. That had to be done by a specialist who was coming in once a week so guy could bathe. Which, frankly, once a week for a bath seems like it's probably a little bit too often. Um, it says, when the guards delivered meals, however, he would always drip miso soup on the handcuffs and food slot, both of which eventually became corroded, allowing Shiratori to break them. All right, so this is 1943, he gets there, right? On August 26, 1944, he dislocates both of his shoulders and fits out the narrow food slot in his cell door and escapes the prison using a wartime blackout as cover. What's a wartime they lost, blackout? They lost power oh, okay. due to, like, bombing or something, and he's been dripping miso soup on the fucking food slot for a year, 
So it's corroded enough for him to bust out of after he dislocates both of his shoulders. What a psychopath. After living in an abandoned mine deep in the mountains for two years, he descended to a nearby village and learned of the surrender of Japan. However, he was captured yet again after fatally stabbing a farmer who attacked him after he was caught stealing a tomato from his farm. Shiratori said it was an act of self-defense. For his previous escapes... And the farmer's murder, Shiratori was sentenced to death by the Sapporo District Court. At Sapporo Prison, he was placed in a specially designed cell with high ceilings and windows smaller than his head. Maybe at this point, consider getting him a cell with just no windows? Why, why would you risk it? Anyway, it says, However, the prison guards at Sapporo had so much faith in this cell that they no longer bothered to handcuff Shiratori. Stupid. And because they paid so much attention to his ceiling escapes, they neglected the floors. So in 1947, he dug his way out by making a tunnel with miso soup bowls. Why were they still serving him miso soup? It's, yeah, you, you would think they would have learned from the last time. I mean, come on. He was placing the dirt in a small pocket underneath the floorboards. After a year of freedom, it is said that Shiratori was offered a cigarette by a police officer in a park. In, in 1948, cigarettes were luxury items in Japan, and he was so moved by the kindness that Shiratori admitted he was an escaped convict and offered to be turned in. He's going back again. Again. What the fuck? So he's arrested again, he's tried again, but the High Court of Sapporo, having reviewed his case, decided that the farmer's death was indeed a result of an act of self-defense, and that during his escapes, he had not once injured or killed a single guard. As a result, the court revoked his death sentence, instead sentencing him to 20 years for his escapes. Shiratori's request to be imprisoned in Tokyo was also granted, and he spent 14 years in Fuchu prison until 1961 when he was released for good behavior. Later, he returned to Aomori to reunite with his daughter, and his wife had died while he was in prison. So Shiratori lived for another decade working odd jobs to survive and eventually succumbed to a heart attack in 1979 at the age of 71. See? 71. I could be halfway home. Midlife crisis. Um, it yeah. sounds to me, though, like maybe this guy just hated his wife. And he wanted to be incarcerated until yeah, she died. Yeah, he was going through his own midlife crisis. Like, <laughs> I gotta, let me just see if I can escape some prisons. He's uh, giving Michael Schofield a run for his money there. Oh, with yeah. All the prison breaks. Oh, yeah. This guy was the GOAT. I, I, seriously, it does sound like on some level he may have inspired Shawshank Redemption. Like, they used multiple things from this dude's real-life escapes for that movie, which I believe was made in, like, the 70s? I'm going to look it up. Shawshank Redemption, 1994. I was only 20 years <laughs> off. Close, yeah. Close, but no cigar. Anyway, crazy stuff. And that's today's Stuff to Wikipedia When You're High. Yoshi Shiratori. If you're trying to get in good enough shape to escape from prison repeatedly like he did, today's next sponsor is for you. It's FitBod. Personally, with a new baby at the house, I have very little time to focus on my workout routine and need something to hold me responsible and keep me fit. That's where FitBod comes in. The FitBod app creates a workout program that's personalized to your goals, fitness level, and available equipment, which is the most important part for me since I'm doing it in my garage. I have a limited amount of stuff and I need somebody to shape a workout program for me around my available equipment. That's what FitBod does and it learns from your previous workouts and adapts as you improve. Start making progress towards your fitness goals today with 25% off a FitBot subscription using our special URL. You just pick a fitness goal, select your equipment, and FitBot will create a custom workout program for you. Whether you've been missing gym time or you've hit a plateau, FitBot will build a workout plan individualized to you. The app switches up your exercises to avoid overtraining or burnout while keeping your workouts fresh and fun. Your program also changes based on your personal progress for maximized results. Whether you work out in the weight room or your living room, FitBod has you covered. Learn new movements the right way with over 1,400 HD demonstration videos. A full year of FitBod is less than the cost of a single session with a personal trainer. Keep up your fitness habit with a personalized workout program from FitBod. Get 25% off your subscription or try the app free at FitBod.me. Slash Ross. That's F I T B O D dot M E slash Ross. Cade, as you know, it is once again succession season. 
As the final season of the show started on Sunday, which we are breaking down episode by episode on another Bolin Media podcast, Oysters, Clams, and Cockles. But today I wanted you and I to have a little bit of a more general discussion about the show. First of all, um, I don't know how I missed this joke during seasons one through three, but have you ever seen the one that's like, Netflix and chill? No. Suck session and succession. Like a suck, suck session. Okay, yeah, yeah, I got you. I've seen it everywhere the past week, like all these different variations of the suck session joke. And I don't know how I missed that the first three seasons, but it's out there, and if you hadn't heard it, hashtag suck session, you're welcome. Um, but as I was watching the season four premiere this past Sunday, it occurred to me that I, I might be hate watching the show at this point. Not because I hate the show, but because I hate every single one of the characters and I enjoy watching them all blow it and destroy their lives on a weekly yeah, basis. Yeah, there's really no one that like I'm kind of rooting for. They're all kind of pieces of shit when yes. it comes down to it. I mean, maybe like But none Jerry. of them have slicked back hair. That's yeah, the problem. No. Maybe like Jerry, she's like the only level-headed one, I would say, but like everyone else is kind of just an, an idiot. Out yeah, there. I, I guess some of... Well, here's the thing. Even, even the people that are sort of Logan's, you know, older henchmen like Jerry, you know, mm -hmm. or Carl... I, I want to root for them, but they've been working for this guy forever, so they're probably worse than the kids are even. Like, And in season one, you felt a little bit obliged to, to root for Kendall, right? right. Like, you were like, oh, he's the oldest kid. His dad totally screwed him out of he was supposed to become the next whatever. But then the more you learn about Kendall, and then by the end of the season, he's you know potentially committed manslaughter, uh, in, spoiler alert, um, he's also kind of a shit dad and just a general degenerate. Like he's yeah, I forget. Like he has kids and everything too. Like kids, they just never bring it up. Ex wife, uh, yeah, terrible father. <laughs> it, it would seem. Um, in and out of rehab, guy just can't get his shit together. He, I mean, and then when it all comes down to it, you look at Logan, their father, the patriarch of the family. And it's not hard to see why the kids are this way, because the guy's a fucking monster. So it's not like they ever had a chance. So you kind of feel bad for them on some level, but I don't think at this point, four seasons deep, I'm rooting for any of them. Like, Cousin Greg might have been the only character that I think you could, you could really root for, but even Greg is a piece of shit now. He sued Greenpeace, man. You can't but sue Greenpeace. He, he did it politely, though. He's, he's one of the disgusting <laughs> he brothers. Is. Yeah, he is always really polite, though. Seems like a nice guy. He's the only one I would probably consider, like, hanging out with for a little while. Yeah, he's kind of, like, the only character that I really... I like Tom, too, but, like, still, he's a he's a piece of shit. <laughs> yeah, Tom... Look, Tom is one of the more relatable characters, I think, especially for dudes, because he, he seems like he genuinely loves his wife, and it's just a disaster. Like, the whole relationship is a fucking mess. And because he's sort of the outsider, right? Like he wasn't part of the family. He married into the family and he's been using the family to like work his way up the social ladder or whatever. But like you just said, I mean, he is a total piece. Like he's a real piece of work at the end of the day. And I don't, I don't know. I can't, I can't really root for him either. I just end up now I'm rooting for everybody on the show to fail because they're all terrible, terrible people. And maybe that's the way it's supposed to be. Like may the other piece of why Succession was so interesting originally, like season one, was that it was like Game of Thrones in the luxury business world of modern day, right? Like it was like if you if you don't know what it would be like to be as wealthy as these people are, which most of us don't. Yeah, ninety nine percent of us. Yeah, don't know then, what you, that is, then yeah. you get a little window into like what it's like for the one percent, right? Like they're flying around on helicopters, they're going on all these outrageously luxurious like vacation destinations and dressing in like nothing but designer clothing and getting driven around in SUVs by security guys and all that. Like that shit was appealing on some level, but the deeper we get into the show, the more that stuff kind of fades into the background, and it's just like. These people are all a fucking mess. And I mean, the difference between Succession and something like Game of Thrones was that Game of Thrones did have redeemable characters that you were rooting for. It had Jon Snow. It had Tyrion. It had Danny before she, you know, went insane and murdered a bunch of innocent civilians with her dragon. <laughs> but there's never really been that element of Succession. And I also, somebody today was comparing it to uh, Yellowstone saying that they're essentially the same show, except that Succession is in the business world, Yellowstone is in the ranching world or whatever. And I just got to say, look, 
nothing against people who like Yellowstone. I get how it's entertaining, but Yellowstone is much more like a soap opera than Succession is. Succession is well-written and and much smarter. Let me put it that way. Not that there's anything wrong with that. I think having like dumbed down, enjoyable, soap opera-esque drama to enjoy like on Yellowstone is probably a better way to live <laughs> than watching Succession and getting stressed the fuck out or whatever, uh, what are, over what all these terrible, wealthy monsters are doing on a week-to-week basis. But I just don't think the shows are comparable. Like in general setup, yes. For sure, like character to character, you can probably find comparable characters in terms of where they fit in the family dynamic. But on like a writing and storytelling level, I don't think that's necessarily a fair comparison. But all that being said, a lot of people were sad that this is the final season when it got announced a few weeks ago that season four will be the last season of Succession. Frankly, I'm extremely happy. This has to end. Like this has to stop. As much fun as Succession is, you are goofy if you wanted more seasons. It is the same shit every time. Every four in a row. Episode one comes, the setup is revealed, and it's the same fucking thing. The kids are, you know, either divided or up against their dad in one way or another, and the dad is at the top. It's just the same thing, slightly different circumstances. New quippy lines. They try to dethrone Logan. Logan wins again. The kids are all morons. They all make the same mistakes and end up blowing it. I love the show, but you have to end this thing. You have to land the plane before it gets too weighty and before they wade any deeper into the waters of repetition. They've got to stop this now before they end up like fucking Dexter, which was great, great through four seasons. One of the my favorite shows ever. And then they kept going, and it just kept getting worse And then they had one of the worst finales in the history of TV where everybody watching was just like, what the fuck was that? It happened with Californication. As I've said on OCC several times, Showtime is like the greatest at this. They'll get a good show and they're like, we will never stop this train. It just keeps going, keeps going, keeps going until it's dog shit. Too many TV shows and modern day, too many film franchises, they go on too long trying to secure more and more bags of money. And even if that works, they end up losing like the the reputation that they had established with a great show or film franchise by having dog shit seasons and all the repetition and played out storylines and forcing in the next movie and the next movie. It reminds me of like when they rebooted Lord of the Rings with the Hobbit trilogy. And it was just it's nowhere near the same quality. Yeah, they kind of lose the the magic. Yes. With it. Like, they're more focused on, like, getting the, the money and all that instead of, like, what made Lord of the Rings, for example, great in the first place. Yeah, it was it was not good. And, uh, you know, Lord of the Rings is a great example just because there's also now a billion-dollar TV show around it. It's like they just keep going. And the show's okay. It's okay. It's fun, especially if you're a huge LOTR nerd. But this is a thing that happens really, really often in entertainment. And I, I'm happy to see Succession being self-aware enough to be like, nope, we're good, we're done. They're not getting canceled. It's not like a viewership issue. They've just decided they want to end the show before they go too far. And apparently, this season, according to Brian Cox, the guy who plays uh, Logan Roy, is like the best. And they did a really good job of ending it when they needed to. And I trust his word more than anybody else on the show, probably. So I'm excited to see what happens. Yeah, I think after like, Game of Thrones, HBO kind of realized we can't be going like that many seasons anymore because, like, I mean, it gets messy. Ending after four seasons, um, I saw House of the Dragon is going to end after three or four. Yeah, and uh, The Last of Us is going to be like two or three, and they're they're just like shutting it down after that because they don't want to keep a story going if there's not a story to tell. Exactly, and that's honest. I, you know, the circumstances with Game of Thrones were a little bit different in that there was all this source material, and then they ran out of source material, and then they kept going. But I think if they could go back and redo it, they probably wouldn't have delved into that final season, right? They would have found a way to, like, wrap it up, and, like, maybe they could come back to that story when the books did get finished, which we all know now will never, ever happen. But, um, yeah, that was... You want to avoid especially when you've built something that is so beloved and and critically and commercially acclaimed. You don't want to shit all over it. You don't want to destroy it just because you're trying to get more money out of it. And I felt like after season three that Succession was dangerously close to that point where it was like, okay, we get it. We get it. These people are terrible and they're doing terrible things on a weekly basis. But 
the allure for me and the big overarching reason I wa- I'm so into this show and watch it every week and I'm so excited to discuss it on Oysters, Clams, and Cockles every week is the way that it's written. Like, I could I could watch Tom and Greg talk to each other for an hour straight. Yeah, I just need like a spinoff show with those guys. Yeah. Just called The Disgusting Brothers. That's it. Yeah. You're done. Next HBO show, The Disgusting Brothers would be great. We'd all tune in for that. Um, but yeah, happy they're ending it. We're covering every episode on Oysters, Clams, and Cockles all season long. I had to do episode one's recap by myself because Barrett was in Asia doing business, um, you know, getting some altitude on things. And uh, it was, uh, it was like, as I was going through what occurred in the episode, I was just like, this show is so absurd. Like, this is such a ridiculous, ridiculous television program. And I love it for that reason. It's wildly entertaining. A lot of fun to watch these people blow it. But, uh, yeah, it's an interesting one in terms of, like, it. there's no likable characters, and yet you're there every week enjoying watching these unlikable dickheads do what they do. Um, speaking of watching things on the telly, I watched the Boston Strangler movie. It's on Hulu right now. It's starring Kira Knightley. And... And it was all right. Like, Kira Knightley was the draw for me, though. Like, I'm a big fan of her work, right? Like, I think Pirates of the Caribbean was probably the first thing I ever saw her in, if I remember correctly, and kind of fell in love with her as an actress. She's just amazing, and she yeah, has an accent, obviously. I'm not sure I can recommend that fans of Kira Knightley watch The Boston Strangler because it is the first film of hers I have ever watched where she uses an American accent. And it really threw me off. It took me like 20 minutes to even get used to hearing her talk that way. But it might have also ruined her forever for me. Because it's not good. It's not good. I don't know why. I don't even know if it's that it's not good or just seeing an American accent come out of her face is so jarring that it makes it automatically seem bad. But it really threw me off. And it turns out, since we talk about stuff like this on this show... I had never, I've never done a stuff to Wikipedia when you're high or a serial killers you haven't heard of about the Boston Strangler. And that case was crazy interesting because it was in the 1960s, all right, in Boston. And police were so ill-equipped to deal with serial killers at that time. Like this was before the serial killer era of the 1970s and then police really deciding they were going to work together county by county, state by state, sharing information and databases and whatnot which really enabled them to deal with serial killers, they were so inept that it it was probably, like the Boston Strangler, when you hear that, you think, okay, it was one guy who went around strangling women. It was, pro- it was not. It was definitely more than one dude. Um, and in more ways than one. Not only was it probably more than one dude doing the a- actual Boston Stranglings, but then there were all these like, quote, you know, you could call them copycat killers, if you will, but they weren't really copycat killers. They were people who were like, all right, there's this strangler on the loose. They haven't found him. They got no clue who it is. I'm going to use this guy and get away with killing someone in the way that he does, because all these details were in the newspapers and shit. I'm going to do the things he did, do his trademark and whatnot to get rid of this chick that I'm having an issue. Like one guy had gotten his secretary pregnant. And they're pretty sure, like, she ended up being one of the victims of the Boston Strangler. And they're pretty sure, like, it was just him. And he was like, oh, my God, the Boston Strangler got got her. her. Yeah, exactly. Dang. It's fucked up, right? But, like, there was a lot of that going on, too. So they don't even know how many victims were actually victims of the Boston Strangler versus, like, some other dude getting away with murder because he was trying to fix his own problem he had with some woman or whatever. Just a mess. Did they ever catch... Like Not couple. really. I mean, they they got some of the people that were involved in this for sure. Um, the one of the main guys that they did end up linking with DNA evidence to, like the thirteenth victim, I think it was. He gets like murdered in prison, and so they never really get any more out of him. But the whole thing was a disaster. Like the way it was handled by the police, the way it was handled, um, in general, was just it was not good. But. Uh, the movie's all right. It just like if you're into this, if you're into true crime and this sort of thing, it's probably up your alley. But if you're a huge Kieran Knightley fan, just be careful, okay? Because it, the American accent. That's kind of surprising to me because I feel like the the UK actors and actresses usually do a pretty good d- job with American accents. I think she has such a distinct way of speaking when when she's not having Was to she do doing another the, accent. Uh, a Boston accent too, or. 
Was it just not like a, really? It's just kind of a generic American accent. But she's one of these people that like barely moves her mouth when she talks. Mm-hmm. Like the, she's like this. She just keeps her teeth kind of together, and it's like all lips, and you can't yeah. even really see like. And I don't think that that part of it like it didn't translate well because she talks the same way stylistically that she normally does in terms of mouth movement, but a totally different voice is coming out, and it's like this generic American chick, which it just it fucked me up. Anyway. That's all my TV talk for today. Today's episode is also brought to you by Mind Bloom. If you don't live with anxiety and depression, it's easy to just look at someone, maybe someone you love even, and wonder why they can't just get up and get going and fix themselves, right? Or maybe you're wondering this about yourself. You see others living their life when you'd settle for one day without the feeling of everything collapsing in on you. It's hard, but it doesn't have to be this way. Mind Bloom knows this and can help. Sometimes it takes more than just changing your routine, meditating more, working out, attending therapy, or whatever. You need something to unlock your brain, a new way of thinking about and seeing the world. And maybe that thing is guided ketamine therapy from Mind Bloom. At home, ketamine therapy is a new tool to improve your mental health, and Mind Bloom is the leader in at-home ketamine therapy, having safely helped thousands of people overcome their anxiety and depression. Unlike traditional talk therapy, ketamine works very quickly, doesn't have the unpleasant side effects of traditional antidepressants either, which is what makes it so interesting to me. And in a study of over 1,200 Mind Bloom clients, 89% reported improvements in their anxiety and depression after only two sessions. Right now, MindBloom is offering the RBP gang $100 off your first six-session program when you sign up at mindbloom.com slash RBP and use code RBP at checkout. Go to mindbloom, M-I-N-D-B-L-O-O-M dot com slash RBP, promo code RBP, for $100 off your first six-session program today. That's mindbloom.com slash RBP, promo code RBP. And now it's time for some insane headlines of the day. First up, Maryland court reinstates murder conviction of serial subject Adnan Saeed. Cade, did you listen to Serial back in the day? The podcast uh, about Adnan Saeed? Never heard of uh, it. Then no. this won't piss you off as much as it does me. Uh, but this is the story from CNN. A Maryland, a Maryland, I don't know why I said it that way, Maryland appellate court on Tuesday reinstated the conviction of Adnan Saeed, the man who spent over two decades behind bars for the 1999 killing of his ex-girlfriend, Hyman Lee, whose murder case was featured in the landmark podcast, Serial. Now, Serial was a fascinating like uh, moment in pop culture for, for uh, worldwide, really, and was kind of the thing that brought podcasting into the mainstream. It's like the biggest podcast of all time, and it was focused on this incredibly interesting case where this guy, Adnan Saeed, was accused of murdering his girlfriend, Hyman Lee, and he, he goes to prison, but essentially the Sarah Koenig was the name of the podcaster. She was able to like do all these interviews with him and find all this, do all this reporting about the case and how it was tried and the lawyers, and et cetera, et cetera, that found it to be like very flimsy. Like it was full of holes, like to the point that this guy should not have been in jail. Like even if he did it, sort of, it was like, you know how the justice system is. Right. Um, it was like there was no reason that he got convicted. It was crazy. It was a mess. There was very little evidence and it was just a very confusing situation. Um, huge news. Like I think it was in 2021 or 2022, maybe that. Adnan was finally getting out of prison after they had done like appeal after appeal after appeal. He finally got out. Okay. And it was like, oh God, look at that. Serial, the podcast really worked out. It freed an innocent man. And now everybody can just move on from talking about Serial after fucking eight years of talking about Serial and talking about Adnan Saeed and talking about this whole situation with this this poor girl that got killed and nobody really knows who who it was. So we're back again. And in a two-to-one ruling, the appellate court said the lower court had violated the rights of the victim's brother, whose name is Young Lee, when he was supposed to be allowed to attend a key September hearing when a judge vacated Saeed's conviction, leading to his release. It says, quote, because the circuit court violated Mr. Lee's right to notice of and his right to attend the hearing on the state's motion to vacate, This court has the power and obligation to remedy those violations as long as we can do so without violating Mr. Saeed's right to be free from double jeopardy, the court's opinion said. Uh, Assistant Public Defender Erica Souter, Saeed's attorney and director of the Innocence Project Clinic, 
said the appellate court reinstated the conviction, quote, not because the motion to vacate was erroneous, but because Miss Lee's brother did not appear in person at the vacatur hearing. Holy shit, is serial season one ever going to fucking end? Uh, this is like the gist of it. They, they, they motion to like, uh, what is it called? Uh, get rid of his, his, they vacated his conviction, excuse me, vacated his conviction. But because they didn't allow the victim's brother to be there at the vacation of that conviction, it is now being undone. So essentially, he is still a convicted murderer, but he doesn't have to go back to prison. It's insane. Just, it's like another, just another one of those things about our justice system where you're like, wait, what? Like, what? They, they got rid of his conviction. He gets out of prison after 20 fucking years. And then now they're like, oh, sorry, we forgot to tell the brothers so that he could have the option to be there. We got to reinstate the conviction. So, so he's still labeled as a... So he's still a convicted, convicted. murderer. Yeah. It's a mess. Um, and I mean, I'm glad that Hyman Lee's name will, you know, live on forever. But at this point, I think we're all just ready to move on. Like from this absolutely miserable situation that never seems to come to an end. I can't take it anymore. I can't take it anymore. And at the end of the day, it's whatever her family, whatever Hyman Lee's family wants and whatever's good for them, that's what I want it obviously doesn't actually personally affect me. It just feels like it's been year after year after year. It's like no more Adnan Saeed. For the love of God, please. How long? Can't, how long ago did this case happen? Oh my God. Uh, I mean, well, I guess over twenty years. It was but... nineteen ninety nine when he, when she got killed, and then I think the podcast dropped in like uh, two thousand and sixteen. I want to say. 2014 was season one, okay? And it was like, again, it was like the thing that like brought podcasts to like the forefront, like the mainstream. And when it ends, like when season one of the podcast ends, you expect that it's going to be like, and we got him out of prison. And it, that doesn't happen. You're just like, wait, what? I just listened to all that shit for this dude to still be behind bars. So the big payoff was like in 2021 or whatever, when they finally let him out, like, oh, good. Good, that 10 hours of my life I spent listening to Serial wasn't all for naught. And now, it feels like it doesn't matter again. It's just crazy. It's a crazy, crazy story that, I mean, is like, it, it is the thing that blew up the true crime uh, genre, the killing of Hyman Lee, which, uh, again, terrible tragedy, horrible loss of life, but oh my God, I'm sick of hearing Adnan Saeed's name, who is the convicted uh, murderer, who now has the conviction reinstated. Next headline. NYPD pulls promotion of officer accused of stuffing panties in underling's mouth. Underling is not a person's name. That's like, it was a, uh, someone underneath uh, her. Like a subordinate? Or... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, from the New York Post, the NYPD pulled the promotion of an officer being sued for allegedly stuffing her panties in a male underling's mouth days after the Post reported on the plans to boost her in the ranks. Sergeant Anne Marie Guerra, who was expected to get bumped up to the role of sergeant supervisor of the detective squad on Friday, it was a big job. She had her promotion rescinded, the NYPD confirmed yesterday. Guerra is being sued in Brooklyn Federal Court over the October 7, 2018 incident. This is five years ago. But an incident in which she allegedly lost it on Detective Victor Falcone, which sounds like, or Falcon, I guess. Not, this isn't Arkham. Uh, Doctor or Detective Victor Falcon, after he complained, it still sounds like a fake name, Detective Victor Falcon. He complained about her habit of leaving her underwear around the unisex locker room at their Brooklyn station house. Quote, in a fit of rage, Defendant Guerra ignored all protocol, retrieved her soiled underwear, and violently shoved them into Falcon's mouth, and then aggressively rubbed them all over Falcon's face. Uh, end quote. That's what Falcon claims in this lawsuit, which is still pending and is a lot of men's dream. It says, quote, the sexually charged and violent gender motivated assault left Falcon traumatized and in shock. Guerra screamed in his face. See, they are fucking clean. Damn. It's a <laughs> hell of a way to go about proving that your panties are clean. I mean, just as a general rule of thumb, I think male, female, it doesn't matter, no matter where you lie on the sexual spectrum, you can't just leave your undergarments strewn about the fucking locker room. 
No, it's unsanitary. It, it's just, it's unsightly. It's rude. Certainly, if somebody else calls you out on it, especially an underling. I'm surprised they have a, a unisex locker room. I feel like they would. Right? Like, that would cause a lot more problems. But we haven't heard a lot of horny cop stories lately in the news, though, about, you know, cops getting in trouble yeah. for having orgies and such. So yeah, you know, cops get horny, too. I mean, that's the, that's the problem with these unisex bat, uh, locker rooms is that if you've got too many horny cops in there, somebody's inevitably going to get panties shoved in their mouth by choice or otherwise. But, yeah, you, I mean, just for the record, Cade, you can't just start leaving your soiled underwear around the studio. And if I get upset with you for doing so, you can't shove Are them you? in my mouth. Please. Please don't. In other news, I was thinking about Carl Havoc. Uh, you know, the prank show sketch from I Think You Should Leave with Tim Robinson, season two. For those of you who haven't watched it, just bear with me. But I was thinking about that sketch, kind of laughing about it. I've been re-watching some of, uh, some of the show because, you know, you can blow through it in like a half day, the whole two seasons, because they're 17, 20-minute episodes. Um, but it occurred to me that Carl Havoc might actually be a metaphor for depression. Like, if you think about it, He's got too much shit on him, and as a result, he doesn't want to be around anymore. He's putting on all this shit, too much shit, really, assuming this character, right, and going into a mall for the purpose of pranking people, which he can't even bring himself to do because it's so stupid, right? That's basically how depression feels. Like, you, you can no longer find happiness in the character you've assumed, and you've just got too much shit on you to go on. And the further I get removed from my first watch through of I Think You Should Leave, the more I think I might be finding like hidden meaning and depth to the show that I just didn't pick up on my first time through. Like maybe Tim Robinson is even more of a genius than I thought. And we all have a little Carl Havoc in us sometimes. Maybe we just need to take all this shit off and find happiness in who we really are rather than assuming a character to entertain others. Maybe then we'd want to be around more. Yeah, you know, sometimes the chin just kills and you just want to rip it off. <laughs> the chin. But seriously, I think there was something to that sketch that I missed the first time through. Because, like, you know, when you just get overwhelmed by life, there's just right. too much going on. You're behind at work. You're, you're struggling in your social life. Your relationship has problems. You've, you've got family issues. Taxes are due. Your dog is sick. You just got too much shit on you. And you don't want to be around anymore? Oh, yeah. No, I've, I've been there. I've been in Carl Havoc's shoes. That's, that's just, Carl Havoc, man. Just standing in the mall, and yeah, just too much shit on me. He's just, depression. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. He's a fucking metaphor for life, Carl Havoc. Not just a silly sketch that you laugh at. You know? We've all got a little Carl Havoc in us. That will do it for today's show. But please support our sponsors by hitting the links in the description of this episode and using our dedicated codes, as that is how we pay the bills here at Bolin Media. You can find links to all of our sponsors for today's episode in the description below. Or you can go to bolinmedia.com and click on like the Sponsors tab, and you can see all of our sponsors for all of our shows. To check out our other shows, speaking of which, go to bolinmedia.com. We've got Jared Borislow's F1 show, Formula Bone back in full swing covering all the latest F1 madness. I believe there's a race this weekend, Cade. Is that uh, yeah, it's in Australia. Australia. That's Foster's for beer. I want to say it's like the race is at midnight or something. What? Aren't they usually in the morning? Yeah, but because in Australia, it's yeah. I think it's a 12-hour oh. difference. Is it, is it called the Australian Grand Prix? I think so. Because I remember Grand uh, Prix. one race last year, I was like at the bars and it was the race was going on, and I want to say it was Australia. Oh, you, yeah. It says uh, April second at twelve a.m., which is you know midnight. So, so it's really. I, th April I think it'll be midnight. It'll be eleven for for our time zone. Yeah. Oh no, this is Central Time. Oh, okay. It says so. Yeah. If you're at the bar, if you go to the bar Saturday, April first, and you're there as the clock strikes midnight, you can watch the. Australian Grand Prix. Yeah, no, forget picking up chicks. I'm just going to be just locked in on the TV watching the race. And then if you want to watch a preview for the Australian Grand Prix, you can go to youtube.com slash at Formula Bone and let Jared Borslow walk you through everything you need to know 
about the Australian Grand Prix, fucking Australia. And then after every race, Jared does a recap on YouTube.com slash at Formula Bone. Follow Formula Bone at Formula Bone on TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter as well. We also have Oysters, Clams, and Cockles, which has begun coverage of Succession's final season, episode two, this upcoming Sunday. Uh, It's a companion podcast. We drop every Monday during season four of Succession, just like we did with House of the Dragon, just like we did with The White Lotus season two, just like we did with The Last of Us. Good stuff. Oysters, Clams, and Cockles. Enjoy. Hit bowlandmedia.com slash shop to grab yourself some RBP merch or some OCC merch. Like Cade's wearing a party like Damon Slay like Rhaenyra's shirt today, which is still, I'm not sure how socially acceptable it is, <laughs> but it's funny to me. And uh, yeah, I had the Horny for Sunset shirt on last episode. I love that shirt. We've got hats, we've got coffee mugs, we've got mouse pads, everything you need. Bolinmedia.com slash shop. And if you support us on patreon.com slash Ross Bolin podcast, you get a 10% off code to use on any merch you may find uh, purchase worthy for yourself. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram at WRBolin. Producer Kate Oris, where can the people follow you? Uh, you can follow me at Kate Oris on Twitter and Instagram as well. This episode of the Ross Bolin Podcast is presented by Bolin Media, and video of today's show was produced by Cade Oris. Go to youtube.com slash at the Ross Bolin Podcast for full video of our show, plus funny clips and smaller segments. Like the next thing we're doing on our YouTube is uh, producer Cade here is taking like uh, segments like stuff to Wikipedia when you're high and then turning them into a little shorter, uh, more easily consumable video for the old YouTube audience there. So that is that. We will be back this Friday on patreon.com slash Ross Bolin podcast with another exclusive ad-free episode, just like we do every week for our supporters. Until next time, peace be with you and also with you.